May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So when I was in high school, 20 years ago, as my Facebook groups have reminded me, for graduation, you needed 10 service hours. They were required, they had to be signed off by someone, they had to be turned into the school. It was well known, however, if you were college bound, that you needed more than that for your college applications. And so we did likewise. We added more for our resumes. So then high schools recognized their kids no longer had the competitive advantage with their 10 hour minimum, and they added to the hours. And the college-bound students, likewise, realized that if the bare minimum goes up, their number goes up, and so they did likewise. Rinse and repeat, apparently, 20 years. Currently, MCPS requires 75 hours of community service for graduation, which the college-bound students know is now the bare minimum, and so they try to get at least 300 hours of community service, which gets them their participation trophy of a blue tassel at graduation. So guess what? Study after study, including those that came out in the early 2000s that I was a part, like was, you know, a teenager for, have shown that actually making service a checkbox doesn't pay off in the long run. Turns out that teaching a serving heart by requiring it doesn't actually create a serving heart. I know we're all shocked by this. It actually teaches fulfilling obligation. And obligations tend to be fulfilled to their requirement and no more. Obligations are a means to an end. The end we actually care about, for instance, getting into the college of our choice, and that usually is an end that benefits us, so we do the things necessary to get to the end that we actually care about. Now the story of Dives, or the rich man, but we call him Dives from the Latin and it sort of has stuck, the parable of Dives and Lazarus, is an interesting one. This story actually comes at the tail end of last week's parable about the wily manager where Jesus ends the parable where he clearly informs us that you cannot serve both God and money. We skip a paragraph, and in that skipped paragraph, Scripture tells us that the Pharisees laugh at Jesus because they were lovers of money. Jesus responds to their laughter. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force or by obligation and checkbox. And then he launches into this parable. See, Dives, our rich man, lived every day with Lazarus just outside of his gate. Jesus doesn't say whether Dives was greedy or he was a content person. He doesn't say whether he was driven towards earthly success or whether he was born into wealth. Just that he lived sumptuously and passed by Every single day, Lazarus, whom he apparently knows by name, because in this interaction, he calls to him by name. In death, he still is trying to make requests and orders to Lazarus. He is still assuming his hierarchy and authority, even though the reversal of fortunes and roles. Even after his first request is denied to order Lazarus around, he then asks yet another order of Lazarus to go to Dives' brothers to warn them of what is to come. He wants to let them know there's an obligation to be generous. They need to get the checkbox in, which by definition seems to make generosity lose a little of its definition. This too by Abraham is denied. Dives still has missed the point himself, which perhaps is the great chasm that Abraham speaks about, because he is still seeking to give his brothers a self-guided reason to be different. 
to give them obligations rather than inspire them to be engaged in the community and society around them. Divey still sees people as stepping stones to get to the life they desire rather than to see his own life as an opportunity to provide for others. Sounds a little like the 300 hours we now do to get into college. We checkbox how to be a good person. I, I donate food for Thanksgiving. Check, good person. At Christmas time, I make sure I get one extra unwrapped toy and drop that somewhere. Check, good person. When I decide to update my fall wardrobe, I have gotten rid of the stained and torn ones I don't want, and instead of throwing them in a dumpster, I throw them so that poor people can go through them later. Check, good person. We have made being a good person based on obligations. And then we spend the rest of our time engaging in the things that fulfill us, that benefit us or our kids, that give us gains and success. And then we separate out and we say, well, see, good people still can ignore the ugly. Good people still can cut off the toxic. Good people can still choose not to engage in activities that don't bring them joy or don't fulfill them or don't help with that obligation checkbox. For many, church functions as another checkbox and obligation. I come to this place... I believe a decent amount of what that person up there is saying. And then when I'm done with my service, my church service for the week, check, I am done with Jesus for the week. I can leave the church. I can go past the panhandlers that will be at the corner of 108 and Georgia Avenue. And I don't even have to give them a second thought. I can walk by our probably now refilled food pantry that actually empties nearly every single day and be thankful that there are church volunteers who show up at some point and they refill it for those hungry people. I can act like Christianity is some sumptuous purple robe that wraps us up in security and certainty of checkboxes and obligations fulfilled rather than see Christianity as Jesus intended it, which is a heart set on fire for God. The Pharisees laughed at the idea that you can't serve God and wealth because they thought they could serve God through obligations, and then they could engage daily with the pursuit of wealth. But the truth is that nothing we serve through obligation is actually being served it is being tolerated. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were, cre were called and for which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. None of First Timothy's description actually feels like a checkbox of obligation. In fact, he even deals with wealth. As for those who in the present age are rich, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. He actually is turning this idea the Pharisees have created on its head. Do what you're obligated to do about your wealth. Engage your whole self in the faith and life of Christ. So what would that look like? What would it look like if I engaged in God and made my wealth just my obligation? How would that transform my priorities? Well, for starters, it would mean wealth would serve its purpose. It would stay in its lane. It would be a means to an end. Because wealth isn't where I'm trying to end. Where I'm trying to end is a life on fire with Christ. God then becomes the constant, the default. More times than not during the day, I would ask, where is the God in the midst of this situation? Maybe I'd ask it instead of my normal default question is, well, how much is that going to cost me? Maybe I'd be willing to take the path that says, 
This might put me out a little bit. This might cost me extra money. This might not actually end with my best option, but for the good of someone else, it will be. Now, many of you know I'm a big to-do lister. Carry a little book. I have it all the time. It is the only thing that keeps me sane. And I get up every morning with my coffee, and I write down my to-do list. I start with the must-dos. They all get circled, sometimes double underlined. Depends on how important they are. Then there's the hope to get done. Then there's the side column of kid taxi responsibilities that I cannot seem to get out of. Regularly, they are derailed by God. And regularly, I try to derail God back and say, no, no, ballet is at six, and we will get there by hell or high water. But if, in those moments where I can actually pause and truly engage God in my life and not my obligations, when God isn't a to-do list I have checked off for the day, but colors every piece of my list, I will guarantee you right now it does not make you more productive. But it does transform my priorities. It does mean that my must-dos sometimes transform into that can wait. It may mean that I actually end up with my four-year-old on the couch watching the horror that is Peppa Pig for 30 minutes because that's where God needs me to be in that moment and not doing the email or the whatever I thought was the must-do of the day. You know, we budget similarly. There's two ways to budget, really. There's one where we say, this is mandatory, so what does it cost? And then we put it in the spreadsheet. And then we have all the extra money, and we say, okay, well, this is what I have extra. Where are my luxuries, and what can I afford? Often we give church the latter category. This is my luxury. What can I afford to give you? And because we've gone through our necessities, and the necessity may or may not include Hulu and Netflix, it is the cultural default that we budget by this necessities of what they cost first, and we give God the excess. The God money is flexible. Now, First Timothy warns that the love of money is the root of all evil, and this is exactly why. Because it reroutes, it redirects us, it makes us think certain things are the priority when they are not. It makes me assume that my extras are more important than someone else's necessity. The thing about a budget is it's a moral document. You can pick it up and read the family or household's priorities by it. If I picked up yours, I bet you I could tell what it is you valued. And if you picked up mine, you certainly could as well. Money shows what you love. Money likes to become its own priority. Priorities. That's where we see obligation versus engagement, where Divies never figured it out because he lived comfortably, sumptuously even, and was willing to just leave Lazarus at his gate, poor, weather-worn, and suffering. His extra was more important than Lazarus' need. Now, we may argue that the Lazaruses of our own day are just more complicated than this simple parable, and in some ways they are. We could point out that the needs of Lazarus are more complex than one guy may be able to provide. We recognize now the complexity of poverty, its cycle, its enablers like substance abuse and mental illness. But also on some level, they're not more complicated because we are not alone in this. We are church and we are community. So while we may not be able to serve Lazarus alone, although we could go a long way just by honoring his humanity, we are invited into church community where we can engage in Christ, engage in Christ together rather than checkbox him. And then church becomes an investment an engagement, and not an obligation. It is an engaging in church that transforms church into a place not where we sit like a country club, but where we see all things are possible, where the poor are served, where the community is fed, 
where we come in to be equipped, we plan, we pray, and we discern the best way forward. Engaged church is a church where in a world with hurt and scarcity and pain, we come out and preach love and abundance and healing. Church as an investment means that ministry inspires the budget rather than the budget dictating the limits of the ministries. Christ doesn't want to be your obligation. Christ wants to be your life. The church isn't here to fulfill you, but to help you fulfill the promises of God to the world. Let me tell you, there's a million possibilities of what God can do in this community, whether it's our microcosm of St. John's community, whether it's the community of Olney, whether it's Montgomery County, and not a single one of them will come from you doing just what you have to do. But if we come together wholeheartedly to seek and do what God is calling us to do, only God is our limit. Amen.